Welcome to the Moss Report. Hosted by Dr. Ralph W. Moss, his guest this week is the co-author of a new book entitled The Illusion of Evidence-Based Medicine, Dr. Lehman McHenry. Hi, this is Ralph Moss with the Moss Report. And uh, today I'm speaking to the author of a very interesting and important new book, uh, Professor Lehman B. McHenry, who is a retired professor from uh, Cal State uh, Northridge. And he and his, uh, his co-author, John N. Giardini, have produced this remarkable work, The Illusion of Evidence-Based Medicine. Um, I've just I've just been had you know enwrapped attention to this book and it's really something that if you're interested in the the corruption of modern medicine and what they call the crisis of credibility um, then you must get and read this this remarkable work um, so welcome welcome to our podcast thank you very much dr. Moss for inviting me Yes. So uh, I I started to go through the book, uh, underlining passages. I see that I got to 101 <laughs> uh, notations, and I just basically said I could just you know I could just cover this with uh, with a yellow marker the whole practically the whole book. So is you know every every part of it is just uh, so important, um, and. And so I have specific questions, but I wanted to ask you more generally why you wrote this book and who your intended audience is. I mean, in, a, in the best world scenario, how would you see this book? Who would you see the book influencing and who do you think it's appropriate for? Yes. Well, f first of all, it evolved out of about somewhere between 10 and 15 years of a collaboration with uh, the Australian psychiatrist, John Giardini, uh, who was engaged as an expert witness uh, by the law firm that I consult with in Los Angeles. It's called Baum, Hedlund, Aristi, and Goldman. So that was the beginning of this collaboration. And, and we were both absolutely appalled by what we were seeing in these confidential industry documents with regard to the corruption of one particular trial GlaxoSmithKline study 329, uh, and so we. I should explain when you say trial. Yes. You meaning you mean a clinical trial, right? Yes. Yes, indeed, a clinical trial, a randomized, placebo-controlled clinical trial. Okay. Um, and so, we were attempting to uh, write a deconstruction of this clinical trial and and expose this this, this unbelievable fraud in in this in this particular trial and and how it was uh, uh, influencing the prescribing habits of psychiatrists who were giving children SSRI antidepressants um, so anyway one thing led to another we published probably about 10 or 15 papers together on this and had a great deal of difficulty in getting these papers published. Um, and then we decided, well, it really starts to look like a book, doesn't it? So let's put it all together and, and, uh, and, and, and make a case for not only this one study, 329, but also another one, which was very closely related, um, uh, a trial by Forest Laboratories it's called CITMD18. Uh, now, I think as far as the audience is concerned, the the book is probably written at a level in which it really is um, appealing to uh, doctors and lawyers and clinical researchers more generally. Um, it's very technical in certain parts, and it's also very philosophical in in some parts. So I think that it's probably not really appropriate for a general audience. Uh, but I certainly would be pleased if it if it had influence, you know, beyond specialist. Well, what you're saying is certainly of tremendous interest, wouldn't you? Wouldn't you say for any citizen in this country or any person who's concerned about 
anybody who takes medicines that are prescribed that have been approved by FDA, because what you say is that the problem with modern medicine, with with ev- evidence based medicine, which is the pinnacle of modern medicine, that it's uh, corruption, basically. Well, I, if I'm reading you correctly, and, absolutely. Uh, this is the the key question, and you call on page five. You call. Uh, you say that the United States is quote unquote ground zero for the corruption of modern right. medicine, evidence based medicine. That's quite a statement. Yes. What, it so and, and it's why, because of the way in which clinical that, trials. Sorry. Why do you Why do you think that modern scientific medicine, as it's called, or, or evidence-based medicine is corrupt, first of all. And secondly, why would the United States be, you know, the epicenter mm-hmm. of that? Well, I mean, first of all, I think that ed- evidence-based medicine is one of the most astonishing um, developments in modern science. And, and it, it is something that, that should be rescued from the pharmaceutical industry. Uh, so the, the, if evidence-based medicine were permitted to function in the way in which it's designed to function, I think it would be uh, enormously successful in weeding out uh, um, good medications from bad medications, questions about efficacy and safety. But the trouble is that almost 90% of these clinical trials are conducted by the pharmaceutical industry. It's absolutely absurd that we allow the pharmaceutical industry to do its own testing of its own products. So there's, there then lies the sort of problem with evidence-based medicine. And what we end up with is what I would call the paradox of evidence-based medicine, where the hierarchy gets reversed the least trusted are the randomized clinical trials, which are industry sponsored. And then the most trusted evidence would be then a doctor's own prescribing experience. So you see how evidence-based medicine gets turned upside down uh, give, when we find out just exactly who's doing the testing. So yeah. they design the trials, they conduct the trials, and they report the trials. And there's cheating at every single level of the process. Yes. And very important in this, isn't it, the recruitment of the the key opinion leaders, the so-called KOLs, uh, who are the, the, the sometimes they, they're called marquee professors, the people who um, have the most prestige or are on their way to having the most prestige, who are rising up the, the ladder. And these people are then recruited uh, to be spokespersons and influencers. Um, and of course, knowing I, you don't you don't talk too much about it, but using the open uh, open secrets and especially the open payment data that the government uh, collects now, you can see that some of these doctors are getting millions of dollars in personal payments payments into their own pocket from the pharmaceutical companies. So do you see that as a, as a key driver of this process of corruption? Oh, absolutely. And there's a whole ch- chapter of my book d- devoted to the um, manner in which the um, physicians at universities are co-opted into their corrupt agenda and, um, and then gen- just simply become shills for uh, per- what, what we might call uh, um, product champions rather than serious scientists who are being who are supposed to give an objective evaluation uh, about the trial. And so what we tried to do in our book is, is, is to cover all of the co-conspirators in what maintains the status quo. You know, and those co-conspirators would in, with the pharmaceutical industry would also include universities, university professors who become these key opinion leaders, um, the um, outsourcing of the medical writing to these medical communication companies, which ghostwrite the 
medical literature and the names of these people. Um, the people who produce the continuing medical medical education programs that that are also uh, 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 corrupted by the industry influence and become nothing more than marketing rather than serious science. And then there's the government, the the regulators, which are also a, a, a part of maintaining the status quo because the the government basically sees the industry as their client and they are out to serve their client and, and moving drugs very quickly to approval that in fact have failed the test. Yes. And um, the, I don't remember if you just mentioned the, the medical journals, but uh, I mean, they seem to be a key element. And yet we've had this strange situation where some of the most famous, the top medical editors of the 20th century, at least, issued clarion calls about the corruption of their own profession. And yet there was a flurry of interest, but not much happened. So, I mean, how, how, how big a problem do you see the journals? You mentioned the difficulty you yeah. had in getting, getting your articles published, but what is the motivation for a medical journal to, uh, go along with this to, to, to allow, I mean, the once proud, you know, process of the peer review of articles. And now it seems to be in tatters. What, why would they have done that? Well, um, I think you mentioned uh, ground zero before, and I didn't answer that question. And this is all connected. So uh, ground zero for the corruption is the United States. And this is where we get this uh, sort of um, mass production of uh, ghostwriting medical journal articles for the medical literature. And this is what facilitates the corruption. This is the key sort of vehicle through which the misrepresentation of the clinical trial results occur. So the medical journals themselves are part of the problem and they know they're part of the problem. Everybody is making money. The medical journals are making money from the reprints and the um, and the open access fees. The um, medical communications companies who employ the ghostwriters are making making money to write, write these fraudulent manuscripts. The um, marketing departments are making money. Um, everybody is, in the end, except patients who are harmed by the drugs when a physician relies upon a fraudulent medical journal article and prescribes the drug to a patient. Yes. And the, jur the journals in particular, I mean, we've had Mar the famous case of Marsha Angel, who wrote a book about the corruption of, she was an editor of New England Journal of Medicine and wrote a book about the way that the pharmaceutical industry is corrupted medicine. And I think uh, um, Lundberg um, and, and other, uh, Richard Smith and other edit, famous editors of very, very top journals warned the public about this, but nothing seemed to stop it. It just seems like this is, this is a juggernaut. And, you yeah. know, what I think is interesting about your book is that the, the pharmaceutical industry is the lowest ranked industry in turn, at least it was before COVID. I don't know how it stands today, but uh, in in previous uh, surveys of the public, it was the the least trusted industry in the entire country or in the entire world. But the medical profession has an extremely high trustworthiness in the eyes of the public. But it seems like you have a kind of a dual attitude about the medical profession because you want them to live up to their own ideals, right? But you're saying that they that they have failed tremendously in doing that. Yes, I think so. And I, I think that's the thing that's most shocking about seeing these um, documents which were produced in litigation. Um, and you you really can't believe what it is that you're reading. And and so yeah. the law firm that I consult with has has made an enormous effort uh, for the sake of public health to see that to see that these documents get declassified and released to the public. But in those yes. in those 
evidence, you find this collusion, you know, between the pharmaceutical industry and the medical establishment. And it's very shocking to see uh, that sort of thing going on. You know, and one of the ways in which it goes on is it's through recruitment of the key opinion leaders. You know, that's how they sort of bring them on board. And then you see universities getting on board. And, and, and when this is, is exposed, there's just no doubt about the, the fact that, that, that these clinical trials, which were reported in the medical journals as promoting a drug as safe and efficacious, uh, turns out to be false. They don't do anything about it. Yes. And you, 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 uh, you say in your book that since the companies invest enormous sums to bring new drugs onto the market, failure is not an option. And you say that conducting the trial drug against, against a treatment known to be inferior, testing it against too low or too high a dose of the competitor drug, excluding placebo responders in the pretreatment washout phase of the trial are all common strategies of ensuring success. So it seems as if it seems as if every aspect of the drug approval process has been corrupted. They thought out, you know, over a period of 50 years, they've had time to hone their their approach, their attack and wherever there was a weakness, they moved to shore that up so that now yep. sort of a smoothly running machine, which has gotten enormous, enormous numbers of drugs approved that you're saying don't really deserve approval, don't really work. Am I reading you right? Absolutely. Yes. I mean, the, you know, the take home message for me was don't take any drugs at all um, if, if you can. And, and if you if you run into a situation where you, you, you find that you must, do your own independent research uh, as, as best as you can to try to try to find out uh, whether or not these drugs were reported correctly in the, in the medical journals and, the, and in the prescribing uh, guidelines. Um, and try to find out the best you can what kind of uh, risk benefit ratio you're dealing with here. But, but my tendency is to think that newer drugs that are brought on the market are going to be the most suspicious because they are the ones that are going to be subject to these extremely uh, powerful marketing campaigns that even deceive the doctors. Uh, so I have a tendency to think that a drug that's been on the market, let's say 30 or 40 years, might be a little bit more trustworthy than the sorts of things we see um, let's say in the past sort of 10 years where you have so much disease mongering going on and so much um, um, attempts to sort of influence people to be on drugs that they really don't need to be on in the first place. Yeah. The, the, uh, the over-prescribing and the medicalization of, of conditions, sadness and so forth, which are part of life, but are redefined as medical problems that have drug solutions. Yes, indeed. This is the whole phenomenon of disease mongering, the, the medicalization of the ordinary or medicalizing something uh, that is really trivial. And, and, this, and the potential harms of that are much worse than whatever you might get as a benefit. Yes. And, and what do you see as the solution to the problem? Uh, I read, I did read that, that section of your book. Um, I have some ideas of my own, but I'm just curious, how, how would you summarize your, your approach? Uh, how can this, how can this be turned around this, this uh, octopus of the uh, pharmaceutical industry and all of its uh, sub branches? How would you, how would you begin to change this culture? Yeah. Well, one of the things that I think is distinctive about the book that uh, Dr. Giardini and I have written is that we we take a philosophical approach to the problem and the solution to the problem, and we're particularly keen on a philosopher of science called Karl Popper, who argued that um, um, in conducting any kind of scientific test, that the hypothesis is never proved true by an experiment, an experiment, but it's only proved false 
by an experiment. So the most rigorous testing is the testing that's done to actually try to prove that the hypothesis is false, not that it's true. Mm -hmm. Now, what the pharmaceutical industry is up to, you know, as you mentioned, in terms of the way in which the design is rigged um, of the trial or the conduct of the trial or the reporting of the trial, uh, they've got every sort of aspect of the testing designed to try to prove um, uh, a positive result. Uh, they're, not trying, they're not trying to seriously, rigorously, severely test a hypothesis here. Um, so that's the first thing, we, that we want to return to a situation where we take science seriously, and we take scientific testing very seriously. Um, and that can only be done if it's taken out of the hands of the pharmaceutical industry, because they are not to be trusted for the testing of their own products. So in the last chapter of my book, Under Solutions, we first of all go through about five or six different solutions that have been proposed recently to solve the problem, all of which have very, very limited results. Uh, and they really are missing the point because, because the main point is that any system, any political situation that permits the industry to do its own testing is just going to give us corruption. So what we're proposing, and that we're not really proposing this as an original idea, it's, it's, it's essentially endorsing an idea that's already out there. Marsha Angel proposed it in 2004, uh, and Sheldon Krimsky at Tufts University had proposed it before her. You know, the idea is to, is, is to put a tax on the pharmaceutical industry to test the, the products that they produce. And this has to be done under something like a national healthcare system or through the collaboration between governments and universities where we can ensure that no key opinion leaders are, have got their, their thumb on the, uh, on the scale. Yes. But then, of course, you know, you'd have to also guard against bribery, just outright bribery. Um, not that that's impossible. How would you feel about nationalizing the drug industry in terms of the de development and ownership of new drugs, center all the all drug development within the National Institutes of Health and, and allied institutions? Uh, and have yes, I mean, have the actual testing, the testing of things be done, uh, because I mean most drugs are very heavily invested. The early phases of the research are done at the NIH or other government agencies, and then sort of handed on a silver platter to the pharmaceutical companies. But what if, as almost happened a couple of times, like in in the cancer field, the government basically gave developed the drug with like Taxol and Adriamycin, both of which were basically developed by the government and then handed on a silver platter to yes. big drug companies. So why not just yes. let the government do the testing and take the mo take the money motivation out of the development of drugs and just, you know, maybe then license at a very reasonable rate, license these drugs if the drug companies want to be in involved in this process. I'm not sure they need to, but if they do, and license them to produce the drug. Yeah, so all they're really doing then in the end is just kind of distributing the drug, uh, whereas yeah. the development of the drug and the testing of the drug is all being done in a respectable scientific environment. Yes, that's what, that would be my solution to it. Mm -hmm. Not that that's going to happen anytime soon, well, but that's, you know, well, that's, while we're dreaming. <laughs> yeah, that's the problem. Yeah, you know, it's, it's a dream, so to speak. Uh, mm -hmm. and, and I think what you're suggesting is one step beyond the, the sort of proposal I have. And we, we were thinking, well, what, you know, what's the most kind of reasonable step that could possibly be taken here? You know, we get to the point, yeah. the kind of crisis point, uh, where we recognize there's no trust at all in terms of what anything that the pharmaceutical industry is saying about their own products. Um, and, um, you know, but, but I, I think, I think your suggestion is, is, is fantastic. <laughs> yes. Yeah, so it's um, in any case, there's going to be a battle Royal 
um, uh, and um, perhaps the COVID situation is going to bring everything to a head. I don't know. I mean, uh, the whole society is putting all of its faith in the drug industry right at this point, I would say. But you and I, well, you and I know that this, that in some ways, this is misguided. Yes. Well, I think I think what um, readers of my book would would conclude is that um, this is this is a time to be extra careful in terms of uh, what kind of results are being produced in, in the medical journals, especially at such a rapid pace. Um, it, it's it's just it's just going to be a real test of the whole system here. Absolutely, and and um, I mean, you you talk about the word fraud uh, coming to mind as an accurate description. Uh, do you? Th this is based upon. I mean, you have you had access to a source that I don't recall any other writers on this topic um, accessing, and that were these. Uh, successful plaintiffs' lawsuits, which I never tapped into when I wrote Cancer Incorporated, uh, but it seems like a very fascinating way of gaining knowledge about what actually the nitty gritty, you know, just the the moment to moment uh, has gone on. So this was really, to me, this was the uniqueness of your book was that you you found another another way in to see what the actual thinking and actions of these drug companies was as they as they engineered a positive result for their for two of these drugs right and in those those confidential documents that are produced in litigation they're done so under a protective order that that one mm -hmm. signs that you're yeah. not permitted to uh, disclose any of this to the public uh, but then there's another process where um, a legal uh, team can challenge the confidentiality of these documents uh, on the basis that uh, the company's claim to trade secrets and confidentiality is outweighed by the public interest, especially the public interest in, 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 the, in the healthcare consequences of, of what's contained in these documents. So that's where um, um, the uniqueness in, in our book comes from. Yeah. I think that, that, that the lawyers were, were willing to fight to have these documents uh, de-designated is the word. And, um, and that's not something that a lot of law firms are prepared to do. Um, so once these documents got released into the public, we, we were able to sort of uh, produce a kind of construction of, of exactly you know how the fraud occurred at, at almost every level and the most interesting documents are are, are the email communications that are going on uh, in, internally with the industry scientists and with their external key opinion leaders where you, you see in many cases uh, they they recognize that they've got a serious problem here and and um, and there's a plan to cover it up Yes, which is which is amazing to have that kind of information available to the public. It's similar in a way to the big the big tobacco suit, where they were able to go back and then see the deliberateness with which to, the danger of tobacco was covered up. So you're saying that basically the same thing now exists uh, yep, in the, the front. The tobacco industry wrote the playbook for mm. uh, the pharmaceutical industry. And also, yeah. this has also happened in toxicology. I mean, the most most sort of recent um, uh, litigation here with against Monsanto for their herbicide roundup, we, we found exactly the same thing going on there. And that was the same law firm, right? That you that's right. That you yeah. With. Mm -hmm. And I was also interested in the distinction you draw. I'm not an ins being an insider in academia in any sense, but I was interested in the distinction you draw between your approach, which would be sort of a philosophy of science approach, going back to to Karl Popper, um, and and then this other approach, which I always thought was sort of synonymous with philosophy of science, and that's science and technology studies. And I have oh. a friend. I have a friend who's in that field, and who 
recommended to me uh, this book by uh, Sismondo, uh, which yep. is called Ghost Managed Medicine, which I looked at before I published my book. I thought it, I thought it was quite interesting, but I didn't realize that there was something fundamentally, <laughs> let's say, um, different from the approach that I think you and I have followed and what he does, because it seems like there's sort of at the core of this, at least his interpretation of science and technology studies, a kind of relativism, I think you called it. So maybe you could explain that. What is going on there? Well, um, within the discipline of philosophy of science, there are going to be all sorts of philosophical positions that are um, arguing out you know, the, the di- different sorts of c- conclusions about just exactly uh, what, how science gets done and uh, the objectivity of science and what would constitute, um, you know, th- something that we, we would co- could call reliable knowledge. Uh, and so I think that Karl Popper's approach is the opposite of the science and technology studies approach, which is called social constructivism. So Popper's approach is focused mainly on the objectivity of scientific testing, of giving us something that definitely tells us this doesn't work. Our our ideas are failing to correspond to the way the world is. Uh, And that's when you get a negative result uh, in a testing a scientific hypothesis. Now, so Popper's approach is, is attempting to um, um, retain what we might call the integrity of science by its objectivity. The social constructivists, on the other hand, think that all of science is just a construction. It's a sociological phenomenon. And there really isn't any objectivity to it. It's just all relative to some particular scientific paradigm, some certain kinds of norms of science, which just get adopted by a group of people. Uh, And these are really just all up for grabs. Uh, So there's nothing here that 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 would be they would call, uh, you know, objectivity or something about discovering the nature of reality. In fact, social constructivists consider that to be absurd. So we really are dealing with two opposites here. Yeah. And And in my book, I've been severely critical of the social constructivist uh, perspective and arguing Popper's view in in, um, opposition and showing, in fact, how, uh, you know, if you take the social constructivist point of view, it just plays right into the hands of the pharmaceutical industry. It's all just marketing. It's all just persuasion. And, you know, they're pretending to produce something that looks like genuine science when it's not at all. So at one point in my book, I compare this to um, what we call the cargo cult science, which was a term coined by Richard Feynman, the famous physicist. And and so Feynman says, you know, that that, that, uh, fake science looks like cargo cult science. It's, It's got all of the appearance of science, but it doesn't have anything which is the reality of you know serious um, minded sort of scientific testing. And so I think that the pharmaceutical industry is basically engaged in something called cargo cult science rather than genuine real science. Well, there's a lot more money in it. A lot more well, money true. if you can if you can fudge the results. Um, I, I'm not sure, you know, um, in in other fields, but I know in the cancer field, uh, there's a lot of semantic um, fancy footwork to change the meaning of key terms like the word survival. And the National Cancer Institute Dictionary lists 12 different definitions of the word survival. Mm. Most people think survival means that you live longer, but the way they've constructed these trials, it's... um, it's not. Um, it's not really. The the drugs can increase like uh, disease free survival or a progression free survival, but that doesn't actually add necessarily add to anybody's length of life. So I think you know there's a lot of different ways that they have figured out. As I say, whenever they run up against a the problem, then they have all these very smart people who 
uh, jump on it and figure out different ways of uh, getting around the, the the fact that mostly these drugs don't work and mm. they have a very high rate of side effects. But you know, it's it's a it's a major player in the world economy. Uh, pharmaceuticals is is a big uh, bull bulwark of the stock market. So it's going to keep on until people become become enlightened uh, about what's really going on, about the fraud that's being perpetrated. So I think you're, you know, uh, Professor McHenry, you've done a great job to add another another way that people can understand just how they're being deceived uh, by this uh, oct- the modern octopus, as I call it. Yes, yes, indeed. Um, uh, that, it sounds like. Thank- Sorry. No, I said thank you. We're doing that. Thank you. It's, it sounds like what you're talking about is something that Popper calls ad hocery, that, that whenever you get anomaly or something that doesn't agree with um, what your expectations are in terms of a positive outcome, um, there's an ad hoc modification. They say, well, oh, we must go back and just tweak this test in some way or other so that we end up getting the results that we want. And this is quite common in science a lot of times where you get a ha- ad hoc modification to um, a, a hypothesis to test it again. And Popper thinks, no, 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 that, that lowers the scientific status of, of your of whatever it is that you're doing. Uh, at that point, you should abandon that hypothesis and move on to another one. Mm-hmm. Well, I want to quote from the t- toward the end of your book where you say, Um, we have argued that the source of the problem is political, namely the failure to protect the integrity of science against commercial forces. Protecting science has to be a priority in a capitalist system. At present, it is not because the industry suppresses free critical inquiry essential to the functioning of science and imposes blind product loyalty in its place. The virtues of the open society degenerate into the vices of the closed totalitarian society, and we have lost any claim to participate in one of the greatest achievements of humanity. It's a pretty strong indictment. Mm. Yes, I think the problem is political. You know, it's how is it that as a society, we allow this to go on? Uh, How is it that uh, we don't, uh, in in our society, value scientific integrity uh, and demand that of um, our, our political leadership. Mm-hmm. And so the only it's really, person, go ahead. The only person who has stood up for this um, in, say, like something like the past 15 years was a Senator Chuck Grassley, who is not someone that I've sort of greatly admired, uh, mm-hmm. but you, you, you have to uh, give him credit he yeah. uh, went after all of the uh, psychiatrists who were failing to report, you know, these millions of dollars in consulting fees that they were receiving from the pharmaceutical industry. He yes. went after the ghostwriting. He produced reports that were um, accusing the pharmaceutical industry of, of fraudulently ghostwriting all of the med- medical literature. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, and, you know, he's be commended for that. Yes, so, de- definitely. Well, anyway, thank you so much uh, for being on our, the podcast, and um, I'm sure many readers will want to, to get copies of your book. The, Illu- the book is called The Illusion of Evidence-Based Medicine. It's, uh, the timing of its release wasn't the greatest uh, in the middle of the, the COVID epidemic, but I think uh, this has a great deal to say about our current dilemma, because we're so dependent now on the pharmaceutical industry, and Here's somebody telling us in very great detail about how shifty they are and how unreliable and why we have to be extremely vigilant uh, in uh, interpreting any statements that are made about the safety and efficacy of vaccines or any other treatments that are being pushed at us. So thank you again, Professor McHenry. Hope to talk to you thank again. Thank you indeed for having me. Good day. Good day. Thank you for listening to The Moss Report. 
Visit our website at themossreport.com and subscribe for new episodes straight to your inbox. For your cancer treatment options and phone consultations with Dr. Moss, please visit mossreports.com.